key here is to, you want to get a complete data set for the first, so set the flux load 7 to 10% transmission. Um, collect a complete data set. If the crystal is still alive and working fine, then turn it up to like 10%, 15%, 20%. Collect the data set. This is all additive. So at the end of that one, if it's dead, then you know you could have collected a 25 or 30% data set um, on the same crystal. So you got to use this information then when you go on to different to your next crystal before you uh, start. It's that way you don't want to do any first crystal and kill it. Um, and yeah, that's what I just said. And then um, yeah, so just make sure you you, you never hit the first crystal first with what you did. So and these are kind of acknowledgments to everybody. So I, I thank Malcolm since the. Uh, alignment and also for the strategy it's usually based on one snap that you take right so if your crystal if you cannot index it well from one image can you collect like five degrees for example and look for the strategy or the couple alignment from the ones instead of the snap um, in rapid no so um, we actually talked about this uh, the you didn't you have to do it by hand. Um, the issue is we use label it, and label it requires uh, two frames. Uh, one frame or two frames, um, not multiple frames. So that's the that's one issue. You can, you can do it by hand. Two B lines, right? Correct. And and both of them are 
equipped with Pilatus detector or just one of them? So the C line is a plus and the E line is a Q315. But we have a grant that was funded that's supposed to be for new tech on the ESL. Okay, and one more question. Um, so how do you decide about the oscillation range? <laughs> um, so, sorry, if you can say it, I, I yeah. just... Um, so, are you talking about in general from the strategy? So the strategy come out of best and... Yeah, in like, general, all, 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 I, I understand you always run the strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So in general, you run the strategy, so that will tell you then what I'm saying. And what is the principle that, that, that it uses to come up with a suitable value? Uh, what comes out of this? So, from best... <laughs> I don't know exactly the inside because there's a lot of different parameters, but I know when I say it's a plus detector, I can tell it to set the minimum wedge to a certain size and it will always give me the same size. It doesn't matter, it ignores the parameters. So he, for certain detectors, he kind of overwrites them and says you should be collecting thin slicing, you should be going 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degree wedges. The default for his is 0 0.05 degree. Those omegas, but I'm going to try to expand it to larger ones a little bit, just to uh, point to. So the reason for that is I tend to tell people to do, to keep the transmission and the wedge the same. So if you do 0.2 degree delta 5, 0.2 seconds, that way it will be the same as 1 degree 1 second, which is kind of the old way that people collect the data to make it easier on the math. And then as they're at the beam line and they want to do it faster, then they can do, you know, twice the transmission at the time. But it, it's just kind of a mental thing that we do when we're training people to sort of walk that way. You recommend something else? Or? I just see that at different cyclotrons, um, different paradigms are uh, being followed. So, uh, for example, Diamond, my understanding is that by default, they collect data with 0 0.05 degrees. Um, and, and it just works. And at the SLS, we use 0.1 degree, and here <laughs> you, use, you simply use 0.2 degrees. So I, I mean, there must be a little bit more than to, to, the, to answer this question than, than just doing it always the same way. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering. <laughs> so we, we've talked about this before. So um, we try to do 0.2 second exposures. Uh, if you do any shorter exposures, um, sometimes the data is not as good. So we, I'm not going to get into it, but at other synchrotrons, they give you shorter exposures. So that's why we, we tend to keep the two the same. And, but there's, there's only a few beamlines at APS that have blast detectors. One, we have one that Jim Fitch just got theirs, and they're in the middle of testing. They're trying to figure out what exposure to do, and they came to the same point two seconds as well. So I have found out why the data are worse when doing short exposures. <laughs> Anybody has an idea? I, mean, I, I do like the point the one. The flicker is what is precise, right? Yeah. That's the thought. It's, it's flickering me. That's about. So on our CV line, we get um, vibration on the crystal to the cooling. Okay. And once you get below the point two seconds, then it starts affecting the Flicker, you know, you start seeing the flicker being in your data collection. But that would mean that the flicker has a certain frequency that you just average over one period if you do a point or multiple periods if you do a point two second exposure, right? Uh -huh. So that tells you already the frequency of the flicker. So you should be able to uh -huh. do something about it. <laughs> 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 we actually measured it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so we, we, we replaced the visualizer with the CMOS, high speed CMOS. Um, and you can see from this, this is something now that I've done. Um, for some reason, I thought this was going to come up, so I had it here. So um, you can see in the movie, this is the flicker. So normally, over a regular visualizer at 60 hertz, it averages out, so you don't see it moving very much. Um, but if you do the high speed CMOS, you can actually see that it's, there's actually a lot of movement going on. Um, now, you would think that this would be a problem everywhere, not just at APS. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, there is one. So, I 
Nika, there's a consortium in Greenland. Can you maybe comment about access for people who are not in the consortium? Sorry, question. Okay, the question was basically that this is a consortium in Greenland, and uh, there's a lot of people who are not in the consortium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you want to say something? I will, I will, I will say oh, something. You will talk about it. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take your I mean, since the people cannot pay for being bad at uh, any time, it was not a good process of this part. You can go to any cat or phone or phone or phone or phone or phone or phone or phone. Both have sample auto monitors that we can uh, 
don't have to go in and out. CLN has a glass detector, and the ELN has a ADSC season detector. But it's, we don't have a glass detector, so we don't have money yet. We are trying. Both ELNs uh, are capable of doing remote data collection. Uh, they will discover the target about that uh, later this afternoon. On 24 ADSC, we have a mini cap, cap up which can be monitored on demand if you need. And also we have, on both units, we have uh, so-called silicon drift detectors, which are capable of identifying metals in uh, proteins. You don't have to have a crystal product, even if it is a solution of a protein, uh, within five minutes it can tell you what metals you have. Sometimes it's useful to know if they have metal. <coughs> and also, uh, in the BMN, we have automatic uh, data processing system, as Jan talked about, and uh, Frank is going to give uh, uh, more detailed information later uh, this afternoon again. And this runs on a multi-core computing cluster, which is fast, uh, almost real time. We have uh, around uh, close 200 terabytes of disk space, uh, so that we can store your data for, we, we promised that we keep it for six months, but normally it's there for much longer than that. So if you are uh, Missing some data at home, take with us before you can. And uh, we are uh, also we also have distributed software distribution at the VMI. So you know whatever you are used to at home, if you have distributed, everything's all with the VMI as well. And we have uh, many uh, several sets of uh, robotic parts and tools for use on site or for what people can loan the parts and. Also, uh, we have a walk-in cold room if you are on site and want to do some uh, socialization or protein expression. We have a wet lab too if you want to do. And we have player tools and so on all of on site. And uh, these are the people who keep this team line up and running and healthy and make sure that everything is working well. Steve Will is the boss. Uh, he's not at uh, Chicago, he's in Carmel, but the uh, rest of the staff, uh, they are local to uh, And they are you know, doing a great job of uh, making sure it works well. And we, are, we have the, we are funded by NHGMS uh, and member institutes. And um, as a, mission, as a part of the mission of NECAD, we try to organize a workshop like this every two or three years. Uh, this time we were fortunate to collaborate with uh, SP Grid to do it, and I think it worked very well. Uh, I want to thank Peter, Michelle, and the whole SP Grid team uh, for this opportunity to do this collaborative workshop. But this specific work I'm going to talk about, uh, these are the people who uh, contributed, Malcolm Cable, Igor Pelo, Frank Murphy, and John Shulman. And uh, some of the test tools were given by Kevin Kobe, who is currently in UCSD, which is where uh, Steve Harrison's company. So, because of the, all the things that are there at the mind, the typical refraction image looks like this. People are happy to look at it. Start. Of course, they become sad after some time. In this case, after taking 100 frames. Because, you know, this crystal will be fractured to almost four axons on the circuit itself. But after 100 frames, the fraction goes down to eight axons. And this is, in fact, is from an eight years arrival. It's not a typical, it just happens very often. People get warned by radiation damage. This was collected at uh, 24 ADC view line, find 2 degrees per frame, 20 degrees per frame, 100 frames, 1 second exposure, that's only 25% transmission. So the reason why this happened is data collection is not optimized. So as you know, data collection is a, an experiment which is demanding high goals. What are those high goals? We need high accuracy, we need high resolution, we need high complexity, 
we need high computers. And we want all these things simultaneously. You know, maximizing all these contradicting parameters together, it's not an easy task. You know, they, they fight with each other. <laughs> if you want high resolution, that means you have to expose the crystal with higher dose of X-rays. You expose your crystal with higher dose of X-rays, there is radiation damage. Once there is radiation damage, you do not have high multiplicity, you do not have high computers. So, the data collection process has, has to be optimized in certain way. And John talked about some of the ways. So let's ask the question, what is optimal data collection? And what are the parameters that are there to be optimized? There are, maybe there are not many parameters to be uh, optimized. I have listed here five of them. And I think it that's, that's all we need to optimize. So rotation start, we have to start from. Then I have to already. Rotation range, how much to collect one page. Rotation per frame depends, you know, depending upon how big is your cell dimension. Reflective distance also depends, you know, how, how far you refer to the diffraction so on. And those per frame. How much how much they expose? Of course, those First four parameters, they are very easy to implement if you take a single you know, initial snapshot. You know the word initial matrix. From that, you can know how much to collect and detect distance, rotation, rotation, and so on. This can be calculated using uh, any of these programs like you know, this takes case and so on. And uh, people yesterday, you know, Kai, uh, Phil, and Jim, and everybody is telling you about uh, how to do this. However, those per frame is a, not an easy parameter. It can be predicted using that dose are best, but it is not ideal. As shown by Tobias and Franz in this paper, they took around 50 data sets and they have collected over years, and they computed that. The results indicate that in looking practice, that diffraction experiment is not a talent that is good enough to support such a system. It's not easy to fit to the, you know, how much dose you can put on a crystal. Perfect. So that brings us to those as data collection. So in this slide, I'm going to describe you what, is, what I mean by those as data collection and I'll give a comparison to what is traditional data collection. In a traditional slicing, you take a number of frames, starting from 1 up to n, with a specific exposure, which results in a specific dose per frame. And this n depends upon your strategy, as, as it was discussed earlier by John and uh, others yesterday. However, there is radiation damage. And after a certain number of frames, yeah, here, there's radiation damage as indicated by red. And these frames are not usable for, for your data. So last n minus m frames are radiation damage, so you discard it. So depending on where this m is, you may have a complete or an incomplete data. So that's that's what we need optimize. So now, in those phasing, what we do is the following. We take the same n frames, but we take it with a much smaller dose per frame. And I have indicated the smaller dose per frame by the thickness, the thinner line. And this is thick, high dose, thin, lower dose. Of course, this data is complete by that time, but it is very weak. So, what you can do is you can keep repeating that, you know, run one, run two, run three, and so on, until the crystal is dead. So in this case, what happens after a certain number of runs, the radiation damage sets in, and last few runs may not be used for the data, but you can easily discard them and just take these runs and put them together, and uh, get a complete data. 
So that's the basic principle. Of course, this is nothing new. I know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't <coughs> come up with this. In fact, people have thought about it and they have done it in the past. And in fact, uh, I think B.C. Van uh, is the first one to publish that in the Van Rock. And they call it as a multi data set data collection strategy. And they showed that it works and uh, it's even better. Of course, people in the community did not adopt it very widely. And I think that's because these experiments are done at the CC director. And CC directors do have a read of noise, they do have a read of time. So it takes more time to collect data, and people don't want to wait. Don't have it. Now you wait for one month to blow the stove and you have to collect data in it, you know, doesn't happen. <laughs> so now I think with fast directors like Pilatus, this can be done routinely and the fast directors should be done And uh, two of the um, features of the Pilatus director that make it very suitable for this particular application. Uh, don't, they don't have any real price, but possibly they have very small real price. And they have very small real price. And uh, Clemens is going to talk about that after my time. So let's see what should we expect from a dose based data collection. I call it DS. So, Let's look at various parameters that people discussed for yesterday to today. For example, multiplicity. You know, I mentioned about it yesterday. And I asked me, hey, more number of runs, multiplicity goes back. There's no question about it. And I by C guy, if you look at, starts very weak for one run, but as you add more number of runs, Goes high, and I basically describe how it how it should go higher. It should be a root n function of it. Root n times i by c by one run. And I also showed that yesterday again. R much goes high, and it's not a good indicator at all. Make us know. That's as I described this. Instead, we should probably look at R pin. We should start high and it starts decreasing and go single back. However, that's, you know, life is not ideal. You know, this is an ideal case. In the real case, you know, I basically does not keep going high because there's radiation damage. You know, we are adding more runs, we gain something by, you know, that root n function, but after some time, there's radiation damage. And that will start fighting against whatever you gain by more multiplicity. And I don't think it will start this. Similarly, our pin goes low and starts increasing again. Hopefully, that's what we hope here. The minima of our pin, or maybe a bit earlier than that, is the earlier dose for this particular question. Is that the outcome? So let's treat, let's see this to uh, to to uh, two examples. So the first example is from uh, a protein which had 270 residues, five cylinders. This came from uh, Kevin Corbray, as I mentioned earlier. In T61, it has one molecule per cylinder unit. It is actually well. And we collected this data on 24 IDC defined at the uh, end of 1 to 6 target. And this is what we did. To that result, on that specific spot, we have to get dose based data. You know, I, I will try to keep dose based data in red and traditional uh, size data in green. So this is how we collected uh, dose based data. Here are 60 frames of uh, 100 degree each. Not point one in this case, but you know, 100 degree. Uh, exposure time is 0.125 seconds per frame for four months. 
total dose on that spot was 2.6 mg or 0.65 mg per run. <coughs> After that, we, cal we collected a traditional data, same 360 degrees or a degree, instead of 0.125 and we collected four times that. It's only one run and the dose is same, 2.6 mg. Of course, this experiment is biased towards those cases because that was and you know whatever the difference we see is possibly because we can get that first. So that's why we went to a different spot on the crystal and reversed the order of the experiment. We started with a traditional data, same 360 degree, 360 degree of eta, R degree each, <coughs> after second exposure, single run. And the dose is same. Then we did a dose test data. Only difference this time is, since we don't have to compare this to a traditional data apparatus, we took 10 months to see if the data would become better than the traditional data taken away. Now that we explore the full potential uh, of the crystal. So I will show you a few graphs uh, of various parameters. Uh, multiplicity, uh, those things in red. Sorry, actually, this is those things first, this is traditional stage first, you know, these two graphs. So the multiplicity goes higher than those things. The traditional in the green here, this is, you know, whatever is for one Oh, no, no, no surprise here. And the other case, you now we do a traditional first and second case. We do 10 months and the uh, multiplicity as expected is goes higher and higher and for an equivalent uh, dose, the traditional is you now essentially one times. So it's which is expected. So on the other hand, our PIM, as we uh, as I said earlier, in both cases it goes and you know, decreases as we expected. And in fact, it is a bit better, it's not significant, but a bit better than <coughs> the equivalent to uh, what, what is equivalent for the uh, traditional size here. No, I forget the independence of the traditional. So, it's slightly better than traditional here. So if you reverse the order, you do a traditional first and then those phases. Still, you know, you see that those days you know, gets uh, at least better with our teams. And if I couldn't do it, it was better as you see green is here, and the red is here. So that's good. And let's also look at IPC guys, what happens. Remember, this is not really burn so we we expose it moderately, only two months, six and a half days. And as you See, you now I basically goes higher and for an equivalent dose, the I basically uh, uh, traditional size data is a little worse than what is for dose size. And in the case we did a you know, traditional, traditional data collection first, similar thing you know, it goes up and you know, comparable for and also, we know that the I by C by should go as a square root of n function. And in fact, you know that matches pretty well. In uh, blue, I have plotted square root of n times I by C by of single run. And they match pretty well. And indeed, you also see here that they don't match pretty well. And that's because of the radiation damage. What you expect in terms of I by C by is that for uh, this specific case, my IVCB should have been here. But because of radiation damage, it's a bit low. And then, uh, you know, gives a, also a, a method to uh, identify radiation and how much you have. And for you can go again, you know, this is this case. Uh, IVCB. And we can also look at the CC half. Uh, of course, it's not useful to look at the CC half as a global parameter. Instead, 
If you look at the seas, they have at the higher resolution channels. This is useful to follow. And since you have increases, as you collect more, more data, I think it becomes more accurate. And uh, for the equivalent those traditional data, CC half is a bit poor. On the other hand, if you do a traditional space data, <coughs> CC half of course increases, but for traditional space data, it's slightly better. And that is because we are looking at only the highest resolution shell, and there is radiation damage. It's not questionable, but it's not significant. <coughs> so all the parameters we looked so far is all in reciprocal space. Now you come to real space and look at the model to map progression position. You know, we know the mark, we know the structure. You can phase it again using the same size the density modification. And look at the what is the map to uh, model to map progression position. And they are pretty comparable, actually. You know, that's the magic of Fourier transform. You go to a real space, you know, all, all the errors we have is this kind of, you know, it becomes distributed. And traditional, when you do a traditional uh, data first, you know, they are again comparable. And what, what here we learn is that you take more frames, you know, it just gets to look better. Also, we can look at the average peak, anomalous peak. Right? So there are five cylinders at home. We can go and uh, use the known phases to find the anomalous peak and what it is, you know, average of five. And they are very compatible. Refinement R factors, of course, they decrease us as we add more data for an equivalent dose of traditional slicing, it's a bit higher, not significant. And when you reverse the other, when you take the traditional data first. Again, you know, it increases uh, other than what we see for the equivalent dose of traditional slicing. So the summary of these two cases is that those slice data is not worse than the traditional space data. So, you know, you don't lose much by doing the gross price. That's a good news. But does it allow us to explore top models? That we have not answered yet, because in none of these two cases, we went to the really radiation damage, uh, you know, receiving. So that's what we are going to do with the third case. And you know, this is what we expected, but we never got into this. We passed away over somewhere here. So that's what we want to do with this poor homeric. We are going to deal with it. You know, any beam line without a homeric experiment is incomplete. Very well, we don't actually have one because they different. Well, uh, easy to slide. Well, we have an asymmetry of so Big question. Well, we did that format of the show and collected just a dose test data. No, no traditional test data in this case. Took uh, 360 frames, one degree each. We spent one degree, not half, not find one, not find O5. Find one second per, uh, per frame exposure. We took 20 runs, which is equivalent to 22 million break or uh, uh, one mile, one mile break or uh, you know, This was done at a K. So if you look at the R pin, as expected, it decreases, stays constant, and starts increasing. So this tells us that the optimum dose for this specific Crystal is somewhere in this way, possibly more towards here. I have a C guy. Again, it just increases as we see so, and becomes a part of its fast increasing. And if you look at what we should expect in terms of root and I have a C guy, you know, that's where it should have been. 
but they last so much because of the radiation damage. And in fact, probably the optimum for this is somewhere in the middle here. And we can also look at this is half at the highest resolution again. Okay? Increases, kind of reaches the heat and starts decreasing. And probably somewhere there is the street final <coughs> uh, crystal. Average normal peak heights, again, same, you know, this format it has uh, 15 solvers. So we know the faces, you can calculate the normal peak heights with more faces. And that reaches a maximum here and starts decreasing. And also, if you look at the fermion R factors, you know, it's kind of not very smooth, but it shows a tendency to be at a minimum somewhere, somewhere here. So, overall, if you look at this, this. Around 10 megatry is probably the best total dose you can put on this. And I have a couple of comments about this experiment here. One is, of course, I mean, people say you have to calculate strategy. If you do this, you don't need to do the strategy. You just collect 360 degree of data on every crystal you put and keep repeating it. That way, you expose the whole volume of the crystal to the beam. Otherwise, you know, if you do only a 90 degree or 40 degree, you're just sampling a small fraction of the volume of the crystal. And if you're doing helical or auto scans, for each run, you can change the starting angle to a small amount so that you sample fresh volume of the and of course, the question remains, what should be the total dose for a single run of those tests? You know, I told you, do it with a small dose, d by x, or d by x. What should that be? You know, I really don't have an answer for that. The way we did this experiment is very simple logic. You know, have 6 million pixels. If every pixel has one count, that means my like, uniform distribution, that means high back. Probably there are some bright spots. In that case, I think, you know, if you have around six to seven counts per image, that might be a good estimate to, uh, estimate to do a uh, dose per frame. And that worked pretty well. You know, we, we used uh, six to seven uh, million counts per image. So another question that we asked when we even tried was to, instead of integrating every run separately uh, together <coughs> and scaling together, can we add the images corresponding to specific file angles and process? We have done some analysis on that. We are a bit confused about the results. So I'm not going to present any of this. Maybe I should talk to Kai and Bill and you know, other experts here, uh, Zio and Zin here, and get some insights that will be useful. In summary, so those this data collection enables exploration of full diffraction for the interior of the show. And fortunately, for equivalent dose, those test data are displayed. Now, of course, they are the it takes longer time to collect than uh, traditionally precise data. Hence, Pilatus or uh, any other detector which is fast and has much less uh, real would be very useful. Since this data has a very high redundancy, it will enable better estimation of CC half and uh, you know, sigma. <laughs> And also, it should be useful for estimating radiation damage because we know where we should be and where we are attending. With that, I'm going to finish and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Comment. Okay, so Raj. Yes, sir. I'm looking at this that you collected every run at the same time, 0.125 seconds. Suppose there's something systematic in the experiment, in the detector, in the readout, yep. so that every run done at 0.125 produced the same systematic error in there. Would it be better to collect some 0.125, some 0.25, changing some of the uh, rotation angle increments a little bit to try to, to uh, average out any of these systematic errors from doing the experiment in a similar way every time? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. That's a great, great advice. Take it, and I'm going to go back and fail. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try to be more controversial. <laughs> I think it's like, again, it's a multiplication by who can factor. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right. So you just collect more data and your RPM goes down, down, down. And so I can predict that RPM will always go lower the more well, you start to dig it as you did, right? And it goes up. Yeah, sure. uh, yes. But that's, that's like, because of this. Mere mortals would have stopped collecting data when they solved the structure, right? <laughs> <laughs> well before you discovered that RPM went. No, I mean, uh, you, 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 you can do, you, know, you, you do this experiment in the American way. You should, <laughs> oh, no, you don't have to look there and wait, hey, am I here? I love it that if the detector like that was, it's, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, when you're choosing radiation damage, when you do the predicted uh, auto sigma versus the square, square root, um, it looks like there's a big divergence, but you showed the optimal range. It seemed to have correlated more RPM um, versus run. Is that the one you would like to call? Yeah. 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 Should I go back to the slate? Uh, this uh, here. Go one. Okay. This one? Yeah. Okay. So when you look at the actual versus the predicted, yes. um, it looks like there's a big divergence there. Yes. It is. Right. But it's still in the optimum range. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
which is actually a bit optimistic. <laughs> you know, I, I know, I, I yeah, this is a good. It's probably not a good idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, the corn I mean, is probably okay, but the crystal mouth is, <coughs> is no, I agree. Mean, and now, we, we look at this visually, all of them look okay, seem to have this part of the leg phase, you add them together and say, hey, okay, you know, it looks like a nice data. But, you know, if you pass it, it's not bad, but it's not as good as an equivalent regional data. And I agree, you know, it could be not stable. <laughs> the finer the slice, the more important the synchronization between data questions starting. See, these are, the the these are shapeless data collection in that case. But in each frame, if they're off a little bit, Oh, yeah, if you had added, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in, in terms of the hardware, the Omega is capable of doing around 10,000 steps per degree, and plus, plus, plus resolution. I don't think it's the hardware. It's hardware, you know, otherwise, you know, there's a you know, going on like that. I think things do I have a question about resolution, right? So yes, some people from our community struggle with four Armstrong data. I'm kind of disappointed with your choice of the sample. You're looking at one <laughs> and a lot of time, and I'm not convinced you're helping our community to try to figure out how to get this additional. I, I, you know, I'm happy to do some experiments for you if you give me those four, four Armstrong fragments. Yeah, but the problem is, you know, if you want to compare, you know, that four acts of the fragment crystal, by the time I do one expert, it's dead. And then if I come and show you, hey, you know, I have four acts from traditional spice and those guys, nobody's going to believe it. So this is just to show the, you know, and then we don't show, we don't show many uh, statistics for the high resolution, resolution bed, right? Everything you're looking at is overall resolution. How do you, how do you, how far, how much are you including your analysis? So, most of these parameters what I show is the world, except CC half. CC half I showed one year at the higher solution channel. And there was 1.8 action for uh, Kevin's crystals. And I don't know. John, do you remember what I was commenting? I'm sure it's around that regime. You know, it's the same detector distance. I think it was the same. Yeah. I mean, I agree, you know, I think it would be nice to have some real cases apart from demo. <laughs> They won't work sometimes, but not always. But it's really works. I have a last question. Okay. So, this is Tom Martin, and he collected this in the relatively uh, long wavelength. Did you try to solve it from set by set? Yes. And how it went? It works okay. You know, at the 8 kV, Tom Martin is not a problem. If you're doing it 12 kV, then you have to worry. If you trade all data, actually, even if you take all the 20 runs, it works great. Okay, what about single runs? Single runs, no. Okay. 